Hey, oh, welcome everyone to Today in the Scene by Indie Arcade Wave. I'm Joe, your host, and here on In the Scene, we dive into what's happening in the arcade space from new arcade developers, arcade owners and operators, and just news in the space in general. Now, I helped create Galactic Battleground over five years ago and have been showing it off in the indie space for quite a while now, going to conventions, going to tournaments and shows and stuff like that. And I'm ready to dive into this week's episode. So let's talk to a very familiar face. We've had Adam on here three, four times, maybe. Um, Adam is the owner of Arcade Heroes, and he has his finger on the pulse of the arcade space. He's always going to major shows, breaking stories of new games and things before other people even really hear about them. So let's bring Adam in here and talk to him. How are you doing today, Adam? Good. How are you doing, Joe? I'm great. I'm, I'm glad to chat again. I mean, I feel like we're constantly talking. We're always talking yeah. on Discord about new stuff that's coming out. You're sending me new people. I'm talking to you about them. So let's... Uh, Let's hear more about who Adam is. Uh, introduce yourself and kind of let people know how you got into the space. Sure. So my name is Adam. I'm with ArcadeHeroes.com, but also with Arcade Galactic, which used to be called Game Grid Arcade. I am currently at my arcade as we record this. Um, so it's just a somewhat slow Monday afternoon, uh, post Black Friday. Oops, sorry. Uh, less uh, Hollywood shaky cam there. Um, that's, yeah, I've been in the arcade space for, well, I've been doing this arcade itself for 15 years now, been with Arcade Heroes since 2007, and yeah, just got my hands into everything with the arcade space, and um, just came back from IAPA, which happened to, always happens the week before Thanksgiving, and saw lots of new products, and so more than happy to chat about those and i even got to uh talk with or have lunch with a couple of your recent guests uh from uh alan one uh, who uh, are working on that game avian knights and some other things and so uh, yeah. just ready to talk arcades sweet yeah I'm, I'm glad to have you on to talk about this because you get to go to a lot of the larger trade shows that i don't make it out to um, and you get to see, you know, the big stuff from Sega and Atari and, you know, all these raw thrills, all these giants in the space. So just let people know more about like, what is IAPA? Like, why is IAPA such a big deal? Yeah. So I can't remember what it stands for at this exact second, but um, it, it's a trade organization that's existed since 1918. And they initially started off as an organization to represent theme parks and other sorts of out-of-home entertainment attractions. But uh, over the years, this became integrated where arcade manufacturers started uh, spending time there. Now, it wasn't until, I'd say, the past 20 years where it's been the focal point show for the industry to unveil their new stuff at. Uh, for a long time, it used to be what was called the AMOA show which these days is known as Amusement Expo, and that always happens in the springtime, usually March. Um, but if you read into early arcade history, like in the late 70s and the 1980s, uh, they will often talk about revealing new product at the AMOA show. And so IAPA is like the AMOA show, but far, far bigger. And I've oftentimes compared it to the E3 of the arcade industry. Others in this business will say it's the Super Bowl of the amusement industry. Because, again, it does cover things that go beyond the arcade space. And so they have an area that they call a pavilion. And it used to be called the coin-op pavilion. But because coin-operated use has fallen to the wayside in favor of card systems in recent years... Uh, they've uh, they just call it the games and arcade pavilion, and uh, so all those main manufacturers that you mentioned, uh, plus many others, will show up there to show off their latest products and, and use this as a launch pad for those. And so there's always a lot of brand new arcade games. Just what I've come to find is that it seems like a lot of people who aren't really connected into the arcade new space like I am, um, who may only care about something that Sega puts out or Raw Thrills or something like that, um, they, they don't realize how many new arcade games are shown off at this particular event. And these are all the t sorts of games that you'll start seeing in arcades throughout the beginning of the coming year 
And so I've, I've been trying to figure out ways to parse that out and present it without just throwing it at everybody just because it's so much. And I actually regret a little bit uh, not staying at the show until Friday this year. I only stayed till Thursday, but I, there were a few things that I missed out on. And so uh, I, I always hate that when I'm on the flight back home and I'm looking through all the videos that I shot and it's like, oh crap, I missed this. Or sometimes there's something that pops up on social media afterwards where it's like, hey, we were at the show and we had this new product. And it's like, I completely miss these guys. Uh, like Unico U USA, who had uh, released the Neo Geo MVSX, as well as those um, four by three LCD monitors. I have one of those. Uh, they were at the show and they unveiled a new Japanese candy cab for home, kind of like an arcade one up sort of thing. But in the I think it's the Blast City style of Japanese candy cab. And uh, it's just like I, I remember reading about them and previewing them a little bit before the show, but I completely spaced it out as I'm running back and forth trying to film things and talking with people and so <laughs> uh that, that if, if you ever do go to a show like this you need good walking shoes and you need to be a little bit in shape at least um but also it it is a good opportunity to get your product in front of a lot of potential buyers i mean there's always a lot of business that's done at iapa lots of major deals because again this is essentially the primer for the year to come and so it's not just theme parks that are there unveiling like new roller coaster rides or attractions um, they're also buying equipment for the arcades that they might have but also lots of arcade operators like myself but generally ones that are a lot larger like dave and busters and round one usa and uh, family entertainment group and uh, all these other chains will go there and they'll be on the prowl looking for new product and oftentimes wanting to order new product. Um, but also you get a very international crowd with IAPA. That's one major difference between it and say amusement expo is that you have people from all over the world who are coming there uh, who are, again, are looking to get some good deals, get, the latest equipment to take over like i know um, middle east has become a very huge market and, uh, and so a lot of those guys are there i i talked with a couple of people who said they uh, finalized some pretty big deals with uh, some customers out of i think it was saudi arabia and so yeah there, there's a lot of great opportunities that can pop up with a show like iapa and so that's where it's fun to go and be able to cover it and share it out with everybody else who couldn't make it yeah i think uh i think i need to go and uh <laughs> i need to get a booth with all of the indie guys so that we can have one big indie booth and help split the yeah. cost because this isn't a cheap show to go to and get a booth uh it's 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 pretty pricey but you know the return on it could be huge if, if you get a couple guys in there a couple a couple different groups of games and you know you each pay a couple thousand dollars and you sell one cabinet you you know you break even potentially on it so yeah um let's talk about what games stood out to you from smaller publishers while we're kind of on the subject I'm, I'm curious like we know about sega we know about lai we know about rothrills we know about all these big companies who were some of the smaller publishers that you saw there that stood out to you that's a good question. And I guess I will on the side here, pull up uh, some of the videos that I've done <laughs> just so I can remember, because like I mentioned, one issue is so much of it becomes jumbled in your head uh, that uh, you, you lose track of it. But uh, one that I guess I could start with uh, that I, I've covered a little bit on my channel and a little bit on the blog um, previously is a new team that is called Gesture Art and Design. And they introduced uh, their new game called Food Flight uh, at this show. Now, they had actually gone to Amusement Expo earlier this year in Vegas. And they were actually trying to just essentially sell their services uh, because they're experts in using motion sensors like the Microsoft Connect. But there's far more advanced versions of that now that I think use LiDAR instead of the infrared net uh, that the original Kinect used. And um, they, but they couldn't find anybody that was interested in taking them on board. And so they decided, well, let's just make our own game and uh, you know, show off our expertise that way. And so their first game is one called Food Flight. And they are, they've designed it to be like a 
redemption game, as I call them, video redemption. So you're playing for tickets, but it is a video game. And one aspect of it, aside from the motion sensors that they use, because you don't use any joystick or anything like that, you're using your body to move around in the space in front of the game. Um, but, but one thing that is unique uh, on top of that is that it's for two players. And why I say that's unique is that's generally unique in the redemption space. Most redemption games are single player. Uh, and they're also, I mean, all redemption games are very quick as well. And this one is fairly quick too, but you know, again, not all of them are handled two players. And they actually could do more than two players if they wanted to. Their sensors allow for that, but you don't want to have too many people in this small space moving their bodies around trying to catch food. That's, that's what you do in this game is um, you, you have, you're, you're a robot and you have a bucket head and you're trying to catch the food that's falling from the sky. And so simple concept, um, but definitely an indie game. And uh, yeah, they made their debut there. But I learned some interesting lessons um, with them because they, they actually did hire me i should i guess throw that out there as full disclosure as a consultant to kind of help them understand what it is that they needed to do for designing a game and to get into uh the arcade space and um i i gave them as much advice as i could um from my understanding with dealing with both major and minor developers over the years and uh, one very interesting thing that they learned and i learned myself was that um, they they bought a booth space uh, before they had contacted me, but I still wouldn't have known this anyways, but they bought a booth space in an area called the First Time Exhibitors Pavilion. And now there's not a restriction as far as I know, like if you wanted to buy a booth at IAPA, you don't have to go there, um, but they like to have that area to try and highlight people who are attending the show for the first time. But I have seen plenty of companies who get their first booth in the games and arcade pavilion space. Um, but as they learned, most of their customers did not venture over into that or their potential customers did not venture over to the first time exhibitors pavilion. Uh, and, it, and it's a complete mixture of things like they were right next door to something like a DJ or karaoke system. Uh, and there was this escape room, I think a VR escape room right next to that. And right across from them was an animatronic dinosaur display. And so uh, I think they were the only arcade or like coin op arcade style product in that area. And so it just did not attract a lot of the operators who could potentially be the ones that would say, hey, I'd want to buy this. And so they, as the lesson for them was, we should have been in the area where most of our potential customers would be. And that just turns out to be the games and arcade pavilion. Now that wouldn't be such an issue in a place like Amusement Expo, which you know, you've been to that before, Joe. And it, since it's a much smaller show, it's a lot easier to get noticed regardless of where you're at. I mean, of course, it's always nicer to be close as you can get to the entrance because there are some people who uh, might be lazy and not want to venture all the way into the back of the show. Uh, but uh, that was an interesting lesson. But uh, that aside, um, one thing that they were very excited about was um, so the IAPA organization with every major event they have what's they have an award that they call the brass ring and it has different categories. I don't know what all the categories are, but one of them is best new product. And they were a finalist in that and they actually won second place, which is very impressive for a newcomer uh, to win uh, that sort of reward. It's a bit in this industry, it's prestigious. And so um, it shows that even being an indie, a small company with no, name that anybody knows, you can still um, make it in, in that regard. And I think the first place one was something from a, a Chinese manufacturer called Yunus. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that was a nice feather in their cap uh, to be added there. Um, but and they also were able to find uh, some distributors who are interested in testing their machine because uh, that that's the one big thing that they needed to do next was test the game in a real arcade like this or get it into as many arcades as they can for testing to further tweak it and figure out you know the 
the good and the bad, the positives and the negatives, uh, to be able to um, get that uh, fine-tuned for a, a final production release. Uh, for other indie ones, um, there, there aren't a whole lot of what you would call indie developers at this sort of show, but um, you did have uh, X Arcadia, who I've talked about before. Now, because of some issue with the show, uh, they did not have a booth. Like last year, they had a very impressive booth with a bunch of new cabinets and a bunch of their latest games. Uh, because of this issue, they got connected with one of their distributors to set up at least one cabinet there and they were able to show off a few new games and so they were just focused mainly on fighters i i got some footage of the new omen of sorrow a rising chaos uh, phantom brank omnia i think it's called and arcana heart 3 extend um, i have some footage of the new toho shoot 'em up game which i don't know how much of a following that has in uh, the united states but it's huge in japan and so they uh, they didn't have the presence that they had last time. But again, that is an indie developer. If you ever are trying to get into a show like this, sometimes where let's say you can't afford a booth uh, or you just can't get one in because there's no space available. Uh, if you can get connected with a distributor, as there are several distributors in this industry, there's bets in. Uh, but I, I've rarely seen them take on something like an indie one. But other smaller distributors, uh, like in the case of X Arcadia, they went with one called AVS Companies. Uh, but th there's others there at the show like Schaefer Distributing, Primetime Amusements, Player One Amusement Group, uh, and I think a couple of others. And so that's where EXO was able to get their foot in the door, so to speak. Uh, also at uh, Primetime Amusements uh, that I just mentioned, they had a new concept out of Finland called Sub Soccer. And this is a game where you sit in front of another person. It's kind of like air hockey where you need two people for it to work. Uh, and what you have is this cage, uh, essentially, with soccer goal netting on it. And you have this small soccer ball and you just... You, put, you, you both put your feet into the cage and you kick the soccer ball around and you try and get it past the other person's goal. And so th this particular version that they had at the primetime booth, it um, did not have any coin operation to it. It did have LED lighting, uh, but it didn't have like a scoring th sensor net or display, anything like that. But they are working on one. And on, on LinkedIn, I found a video where that they posted, I think, after IAPA showing their prototype for the coin operated version or the pay to play version and so that one is coming um, but yeah they were another one that used a distributor to find a way to get into the show uh, and you know, just maybe possibly get orders i i would have to contact crime time and find out if they did get any orders for it uh, i'm not sure if they might have under that circumstance of not having the coin operated one but they still got their product in front of people and we're able to become, I guess you could say, more known in that regard. Um, let me think. For another one that's becoming larger, they, they advertise on my site, Arcade Heroes. Um, they're, they're called Touch Magics. They're out of India. Um, they they have their own booth space. And so in that regard, you can... Don't know if they call them minor or major, maybe moderate <laughs> size at this point still. Um, they, they hadn't had a booth for a few years as unfortunately the guy who had been their U.S. Um, I don't know if he was their president or their main sales guy who arranged a lot of the production as well as uh, setting up the tray booths and such. Uh, he died, um, I think, two years ago. And so they ended up uh, just becoming connected with a company called Elot USA. And so their products were just kind of integrated into Elots for a little while, but they've been able to get back to where they have their own booth space set up. Um, but they're mainly into redemption, or I should say redemption play. Um, but they use some interesting concepts, uh, such as projection mapping a lot of the time uh, with their different games. But they also have some traditional video redemption games that they've set up. I have one here called Space Warp 66, which is a lot of fun. 
uh, and it works for both amusement play and non uh, as well as ticket play. Um, but they had a couple of new pieces there. Um, they had the, um, I think I have the little toy here somewhere. One thing running in an arcade, you always come across toys that kids leave around. Uh, but uh, this, this, these little poppets, kind of these infinite bubble wrap sort of things, uh, they turned this into an arcade game. Again, it's just redemption, uh, but it, it works like a crane machine. Uh, so you, you move the, the ball dropper crane piece around it. It actually projects a target onto the surface and the surface has all these holes cut out on it and LED lighting on each one. And you drop the ball, you push the button to drop the ball. And when it goes through a certain color, it pops it on the screen. And so you want to get a whole line of one color or something like that to unlock the bonus to win tickets. And so they had that. Uh, they also had a new one called Crazy Prize, which is a capsule vending machine where it's not really a video game or a ticket redemption game at all. It's just uh, it has those capsule balls with a little toy inside and just puts them on a conveyor belt that's constantly spinning around and has four player stations. All you do is credit up, push the button, and it ha hits the solenoid to knock the prize. And if you can hit it into the hole, you win the prize. And so uh, that's been a, a, a popular kind of uh, thing. I mean, prize merchandising has been a big thing. Um, I mean, that's one, one impression I have coming away from the show, especially when it comes to smaller uh, companies might be that a lot of them are pushing in the direction of these prize, instant prize machines like crane machines uh, or boxing machines that I was very surprised to hear how well boxing machines are doing in the industry right now. And it's it's kind of crazy. In fact, I, I was talking with the developer of a new arcade video game. I guess you could kind of call them indie, but they, they're in a lot of Dave and Buster's and such now. And so they would definitely be more moderate. But I remember when they started off as with just one game, nobody knew who they were. They started off in another arcade developer's booth. But now they have their own booths and that other arcade developer doesn't exist anymore. Uh, but Adrenaline Amusements, uh, they had this new kind of ride, interactive ride. Uh, like one thing that's always popular in the arcade business are these virtual roller coasters, you know, like Typhoon or Virtual Rabbids. Um, King Kong is one that Raw Thrills has done. Um, but their take on it is this one called Drakens, where you're riding on the back of a dragon and you, you go through these wild environments and you're shooting all these enemies and, and such, but it has a motion base. And so it works a lot like a virtual roller coaster, but you can shoot at things uh, and such. And so uh, they had they debuted that. It's a very impressive cabinet. It has a 106 inch display where it uses micro LEDs instead of a traditional TV display. And uh, so they, they were selling that, but it was it's a bit pricey. It's in the thirty to forty thousand dollar range. Uh, so that's where it'd be hard to call them an indie developer at this point. Uh, but uh, they were showing me some numbers and one location that they showed me had a boxing machine beating out this new Drakens game. And like a boxing machine costs like three to six thousand dollars, <laughs> depending on what you're, you're talking about. But it was making, I think, three times as much as anything else um, at that place. And so um, that might be a, a place for you to think about <laughs> when it comes to uh, indie arcade developments. Uh, but th there was a, there is a, a small Polish company called Kalkomat. Um, they, they were at the show and they, they mainly just produce boxing machines and just change the, the artwork on them and slap a name on it and call it a day. Uh, but they, they do very, very well. And they, they had a new one called MMA Boxer, which was a evolution of a game that they unveiled last year called Hit the Green. And it added a video element to it. I mean, it's not necessary to play. Uh, with the video screen, but it has this LED billboard on the top. And um, the, the point of the game is you have these, I think it's four different pads and then one to kick. The pads you're supposed to punch when they're green, uh, but if the LED ring around them turns red, you don't hit it, otherwise you lose points. 
uh, and then the, there's the one that you can kick. It's a very simple game on the LED screen while the game is going. It plays all these little memes or GIFs of uh, people hitting, punching, slapping, and whatnot. Just kind of a little tongue-in-cheek humor there, I guess. Um, but th that was cool to see them expanding their creativity out beyond just the normal boxing machine and seeing if they can find a new way to to make that work um another one that's um i guess you could call an indie or a smaller one is amusement source international and so this is a company out of texas where they were founded by a guy who used to be the ceo of gameworks um, he's been in the industry involved in many other things uh, as well his name's Corey haynes um, but his current endeavor is this kind of importer of equipment mainly from china i think sometimes he's gotten it from uh, stuff from elsewhere but he's generally looked for games that the major manufacturers aren't making and and finding ways to bring uh, equipment to the united states that is just more indie uh, uh from smaller developers but again a lot of them are Chinese, um, but he's worked with some of the bigger Chinese factories out there called like one called Wallop, um, but he works a lot with one that's really been expanding their influence in the industry called Ace Amusement. Uh, and they're one that I guess you could kind of call them an indie, but they're butting into one that's more moderate size because several different manufacturers had an Ace Amusements developed game at this show. So LAI had one called Airstrike, uh, Coastal Amusements, which is um, a company that dabbles in both um, crane machines, redemption games, as well as video games and video redemption games. They always have a big mixture. And sometimes they've brought on some indie developers too. Like last IAPA, they had one from a European developer called Slim Luke Games, I think it is. Uh, but uh, they had this game called Bumper. They didn't have it this time. Um, but again, they had a few different games from this Ace Amusement. Uh, one was called Bullseye Crack Shot, which is kind of a shooting gallery light gun game. But it also has these elements that are kind of like police trainer where you're going through this uh, abandoned warehouse shipyard some sort of place but there's all these bad guys popping up and you got to shoot the bad guys but not shoot the innocent civilians and it looks like it's borderlands the the way the graphics are with some cell, cell shading and just the art style looks like borderlands um ace amusement also had uh, debuted a surfing game kind of for kids but it would work for adults called surf league and uh, you stand on a surfboard controller and you surf and the the racing game itself is very simplified. It's like a super simplified Mario Kart where instead of having a closed circuit course, it's kind of just a straight shot, maybe with a twist and turn here and there, but uh, just point A to B racing and pick up power ups. But I, I was impressed with the graphics um, from what you usually see. And also the presentation of the cabinet looked really nice. Um, this Ace Amusement also had um, their own booth at the show uh, where they had a few video games, including a little racing game, which name I'm forgetting at the moment. Uh, they had their own take, you could say, on Halo, uh, on Raw Thrills' as Halo Fire Team Raven that they call Galaxy Rangers. Um, but they had like a four-player version there instead of the two-player that they had previously shown. And so that this company, Ace Amusement, sounds like they're soon going to be a, a much bigger name. Um, but kind of going back off my tangent to back to Amusement Source International, they have a couple of games developed by Ace Amusement. Uh, they had Skyriders, uh, which is a game like uh, Prop Cycle, uh, where you actually have to pedal these. It has a bicycle like controller and you have to really pedal so that you're steampunk flying craft in the game can move forward and you fly through red balloons and so pretty much a brand new prop cycle just without the prop cycle name and again steampunk aesthetic um they also developed a motorcycle racing game called parkour motor 2 which plays a lot like uh, rothrills of super bikes um, but just looks maybe slightly more advanced than that and graphics are a little more cutesy um, but they, uh, you know, it, it's a good 
more affordable alternative. Uh, and that's one thing that I think indie developers always can offer as an advantage over the big names like Rothrills and Sega and, and so on. As I, I'm a small operator myself. And one thing that really bugs me that, that I've been watching the industry go through is just the prices on everything just keep going up and up and up and up and up. And it becomes unaffordable at some point uh, for somebody like me. And, and when I look at that, I'm not just thinking about myself, I'm thinking about, you know, there's thousands of other small operators who, you know, want to get games, but when you your only options are in the 30 to 40 to $50,000 ranges becomes kind of untenable. Hi. Some customers there. Um, and so it used to be that most arcade machines were somewhere around six, $7,000 a cabinet. And say you have a racing game, like I, over here, I have a cruise and blast by raw thrills. When I bought that, that was, I think 7,300 each cabinet. So 14,000, all in uh, now it uh, did exceptionally well it paid itself off in five and a half months but now if you want the equivalent of that the fast and furious arcade standard it's thirteen thousand dollars a single cabinet and so if you get two of them it's twenty six thousand dollars it's almost doubled what i would have paid for cruising just five years ago five six years ago and um, so indies or any, any smaller developer, that's one place where you can compete. It's like, well, we don't cost you know, nearly that much. Now, of course, I get it. It's a lot harder. It's still hard to compete um, in terms of, say, graphical quality and um, maybe features on the cabinet and all that stuff. Um, but just unfortunately, again, all these major companies have been focusing on trying to make Dave and Buster's happy. Like everybody wants to make something that Dave and Buster's will buy for every single one of their locations. And I get that. I mean, if I could design a game <laughs> that could go into all 150 locations, whatever it is, you know, I'd be set for life. I could retire. Um, but just the problem is, is since all the industry keeps obsessing over creating the game that a company like that will buy, they're leaving behind everybody else. And uh, and that's what sucks. It's like I don't have any intention to buy anything here in the near future uh, just because it's all unaffordable and I need to focus on paying off debts. But like a company like Amusement Source International, they are looking at selling games at pricing that is a bit more competitive. But again, they generally don't have the names. You know, they don't come with the licenses and sometimes the software quality isn't quite there. Like they had a new zombie shooter game that was developed by another Chinese company who I think is called Nito. And uh, they, it looks like a House of the Dead ripoff. I mean, the cabinet was really nice. Uh, the gameplay was okay, but, you know, a little bit forgettable. Um, and they used a lot of assets from the Unity store and such, I think. <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah. I, I, but, you know, if the game earns really well on location, I wouldn't really complain. Uh, especially if it was able to hold toe to toe with House of the Dead. I mean, that would certainly sadden gamers and Sega fans, but for an operator, you know, a lot of the time, what most operators look at isn't so much game, uh, the quality of the game software itself. I mean, they might. Uh, I, I do that is something that I look at just because I am a gamer at heart. Um, but I know plenty of operators in this industry where the only thing they care about is how much money it makes them. You know, and, and how often does it break down? If it's if it's a solid game that isn't breaking down all the time and it's uh, and it's cheap, then they love that sort of thing. And so, anyways, uh, lots of rambling and tangents in that one, but uh, those are the ones that primarily come to mind. Um, oh, yeah, um, there's one other one. Sorry, uh, called Retro Arcade Remakes. And so these are a small team out of Minnesota where they debuted earlier this year a remake of Ice Cold Beer by Taito. Um, and any of you who've run a bar arcade out there or been to a bar and played this uh, game before where it looks like a frothing glass of a mug of beer, uh, but you have all these holes in it and you're moving this steel rod with a small pinball on it and you have to balance it to try and get it into the lit up holes so they created a very faithful and licensed remake of that 
Um, they were there at the show again with the production version, but they were showing off that they're going to do other uh, ver- other games like Zeke's Peak. Um, but they also have a new cabinet based on the old Atari cocktail cabinet for Warlords, um, which was a very rare cabinet. And so it generally goes for a few thousand dollars if you can find one. Um, I used to have one, actually. But... Um, they they have a brand new version of that cabinet that they're releasing to the market sometime soon they didn't say when uh, but they're going to develop their own software for it and uh, they've they're working with atari to, uh, they're definitely a, a smaller one that's um, already making a good impression on a lot of people just thanks to the ice cold beer and so we'll see where they go with this atari deal that they have yeah, I want to say uh, shout out Brian Armitage. Uh, yes. He's he's the guy behind that. Uh, we've actually worked with him in the past, and we're working with him right now. So, okay, um, cool. really excited about that. Um, Ice Cold Beer is awesome. It's like one of my favorite, you know, mechanical games that you find in the arcade, but they're always broken. So, yep. <laughs> I'm glad that he's able to take it and hopefully make it a little bit more resilient to breaking down um that's what they were saying at the show was like you know we've done everything we've engineered it in a way so that it should last long i mean of course it's always you know it's every company will say that it's it's mechanical mechanical, so yeah it may not hold up but you know it still is new tech so fingers crossed that it that it does yeah i I know they're working on it and i think they've got the kinks ironed out so hopefully they're they're getting better from there but Let's talk uh, finally about how do indie developers compete? I know you already kind of mentioned it primarily with like price, um, but how do indie developers compete at big shows like this with Rothrails and LAI and Sega? Yeah, um, I I think it does come down in some ways to, um, like what I said, price is a huge one in this industry, especially now. Um, Like those food flight guys that I talked about, where um, you know, they, they also had a competitive price for it. Um, I think it's somewhere around $13,000, which, again, is uh, not you know, super cheap. But I, I don't know all the pricing on redemption games that are out there, but I'll, they're all you know, pretty high. Especially it's almost where, triple what we charge for Galactic Battleground, but yes. Right, yeah. I mean, so that, that still is pricey, but um, I guess what they're looking at is, you know, we're offering two players. Um, you know, we have a big cabinet and big screen, and they were going to add some other stuff to it, like a, a marquee sort of topper thing uh, and whatnot. But, but yeah, there still are some super, super expensive redemption games out there. Like all the coin pushers, which coin pushers are super popular. And as a gamer, I don't get them. You know, I look at this thing with this moving platform and coins on it. And it's just like, I I don't care. I mean, what do you do? You just keep pumping coins into (laughs) it and wait for them to fall? Like, yeah, but like LEI had a couple of them there and they had one that had a video element to it. But I just didn't sit down and try to figure out how, you know, what are, is there any depth to this? I, I don't know, maybe, but I, I guess I just don't care enough to, to explore it in that regard. But, you know, the, these coin pushers are super popular and they do very well, but they're super expensive. Uh, I don't I haven't seen a price list in a while with one, but I've seen prices on coin pushers hit as high as fifty thousand dollars. I mean, I think some of them are closer to 20, but still, that's a lot of money. Now, again, for most operators, it's like that's fine as long as it makes that sort of money up in under a year then i don't care but that still is something that where the first customer that you have in the arcade business is the arcade operator it's not actually the player Uh, you know you have to make a game that appeals to players because if they play it then that means it will earn well Um, but you do have to be thinking about the operator within that mix and, and even though they are a different audience uh, or target demo than the player, uh, you have to make the operator happy because if the operator doesn't buy your game, then nobody's going to play it. And so that's why I say they're first. And, but of course, most operators, again, do look more at price before they look at anything else. Now, uh, like with Food Flight, I think beyond any pricing things, uh, the one thing that helped it stand out was, you know, it did something that we don't see a lot of, uh, such as the uh, motion sensing thing. One thing that I think is an advantage that indies 
hand that indies have over a, a bigger company is that you guys generally are willing to take a chance, willing to take a risk on a concept that perhaps the big guys won't ever try. And that, that's where you, you look at most indie games and they aren't a light gun shooter. They aren't a racing game. Uh, There's something different. Whereas you go to the Sega booth and anything with video attached to it generally is uh, you know, a racing game, a light gun game. And the same thing with Raw Thrills or Bandai Namco. Uh, the only place where we see a lot of innovations and creativity happens to be on the redemption side, uh, which to me as a gamer, again, kind of sucks. Uh, but that, that is what it is. But I think with indies, they're always much more willing to take those risks. And if you can come up with a concept that is intuitive, uh, that you know, players can get very quickly, um, that isn't too esoteric, that finds a way to be easy to approach but still has depth to it as they play, um, then that's an advantage that you can get over the, the big guys. But of course, there is nothing wrong if you did want a surefire way to get your foot into the arcade industry door. Doing a light gun game or a racing game, it works. And it, it's, it, it's very much easier to get somewhere with those. Uh, like I do have the indie game uh, House of the Gun Dead here. It's had some problems at first, um, but uh, fortunately, it's uh, been operating fine for the past uh, few weeks now after we got uh, some hardware issue and software issues resolved. And so um, when, when a game is operating like it should without problems, then it can do very, very well. And you know, I, I had um, Griffin Aerotech's Sky Cursor, which was a scrolling shoot 'em up game, and uh, and comparing the earnings between the two, it's a night and day difference. I mean, House of the Gun Dead uh, has earned, I don't know, probably a hundred times as much as Sky Cursor did. And so, I mean, you do have to be careful about which genre you go with because there are certain genres which just people don't connect with anymore, uh, at least here in the States. Now, of course, if you were targeting just Japan, you know, a shoot 'em up game probably could do very well. In fact, I think I heard Sky Cursor would haul in two to three hundred dollars a week over in Japan. Uh, but for me, it only made like five to seven dollars a week. And so it's just unfortunately, as much as I've tried to have shoot 'em up games here, my customers don't play most of them. You know, they like the racing games, they like the light gun games. Uh, but uh, sometimes, again, you can try something else that, as long as it's easy to approach that or has a unique control scheme like i know i've seen that uh, one that you've uh, mentioned lately joe uh, perfect pour um that that seems like a brilliant concept to me uh, especially for the barcade market uh, since there's so many bars out there that have arcade games in them um, but the industry itself has almost ignored that segment where the the only game that they've really put out that any major companies put out that's really appealing to bars is Pac-Man Battle Royale, but that came out over 10 years ago. They, they have a new sequel, but still it's, it's essentially the same sort of thing. Um, that I, and I know there have been a couple of, or several indies out there who have designed something that's more for the bar market. Um, I think you could say Killer Queen fit that bill. Um, and I, I, I don't remember. Does Galactic Battleground have a version where you have drink holders in it? Yeah, our four-player cocktail does, but I mean, you know, they don't have to be in there. Sure, sure. And I think that was the same with Cosmotrons. Like when I got my Cosmotrons, um, that had it came with cup holders, even though I didn't request them. It was just a mistake on the factory's end. Um, but um, you know, I did end up selling that game because unfortunately, in my location, it didn't perform very well. But I sold it to a bar arcade, and it's done a lot better there. And so, you know, just knowing what type of arcade you want to put your game into also helps as far as how you're going to approach game design um, but uh, i do think some caution needs to be taken because it seems to me that a lot of the indies out there want to just recreate killer queen but a lot haven't had that same success you know killer queen has been one of the most successful indie games as far as i'm aware um, but you know in some ways they got lucky where a lot of the fans 
were willing to help teach other people how to play the game and their enthusiasm kind of brought them in. But that hasn't always happened. You know, there's no guarantee that that can happen with any game. You know, it might, uh, but it, that, that's a difficult thing to, uh, to, to grab and, and to, um, to achieve, I should say. And so the, the more casual you can make the game while finding some ways to reward more hardcore players, it, it's a difficult balance, but I think that's one place where, again, you can present something unique uh, something fresh, because uh, that's what people, I think, kind of expect in the arcade is something different that they can't get at home. And, and when they find that sort of surprise, then that can bring them back to the location. It can bring them back to the game. And you know, that, that's something that I like seeing as an arcade operator and why I've supported so many indie games as I've been able to afford it is just you know, that's where I can get some other things uh, that I can't get from the major guys. And, and that's also where I've been supportive of XR Arcadia. Uh, they, they don't like it if I say that they're indies, um, but you know, they do have a lot of games, which you would call indie, at least on the console space. And you know, it's like nobody's been making a fighting game anymore. And so I've had to rely on games that are 30 years old to fill out a row of fighting games like Street Fighter II and Mortal Kombat or Marvel vs. Capcom. But you know, eventually players get tired of playing those games. They're, they're not guaranteed to always bring somebody in. And so it's nice to have something new. And you know, the X-Arcadia platform does allow me to offer games like that. Or there's the new Donut Dodo Do, um, which plays kind of like Donkey Kong and Mario Brothers in one. And uh, so again, just something different that I'm able to offer on a somewhat more traditional arcade platform. And, and I don't know. If you have an arcade game, you could always talk with somebody like Exa. Um, I know there was Polycade uh, as a platform, but I know they've been through some troubles recently. They did just relaunch their their cabinet, but I think it's just for home use, the Polycade Sente or Sente. Um, um, but I, I'm not sure how well their co commercial version did. But uh, Oh, yeah, and at the show there, I did meet with... Uh, gentleman who has been working on his own new platform called Newcade. At least that's what it was called last time we, we chatted. He, he was at IAPA, um, but he, I think he was, was trying to bring the game in and set it up at a distributor booth, but um, I, I didn't see if he was able to get it in there or not. Um, but, uh, you know, maybe making a platform is the way to go or just making your game for an existing platform. Um, is a way to, to get your game in there where you don't have to come up with a whole new control scheme and cabinet design. Um, but yeah, so th those are the possibilities. But another thing I would throw out, if anybody out there is seriously looking to get into the amusement industry and get in front of operators, these trade shows that are amusement focused, so IAPA or uh, Amusement Expo, are more effective than say midwest gaming classic or pax east uh, just those latter shows they are more consumer focused or you know, you'll get it in front of players but that is a very different audience from the operators that i talked about um, but you know one of the best ways to get your product possibly with a distribution deal or just find a big operator who's willing to take a chance and buy a bunch of your cabinets. I know these trade shows are a fantastic way to do that. Um, but also again, keep in mind where you're at in the show. You want to try and be as close as possible to other like-minded products uh, so that uh, you're not just relying on mere chance that somebody wandering through this giant show floor happens to stumble across your booth and you know they're the perfect buyer uh, whereas your chances of that would be far higher if you're in the, the same area but also you know with amusement expo it's not quite the the issue just because it's not so massive but i hope that answers the question <laughs> yeah I, I totally agree i think uh going to like midwest gaming classic packs is a really good place to start and like demo the game trial the game get feedback from players so that you know the game is fun and then yeah. you go to these bigger shows and that's where you show it off to people like Benson and, and these, these major distributors. All right. Awesome. Well, thanks, Adam. That's everything I had for you. Just shout out your social media so that people can check out the blog and the arcade. Sure.
So it's arcadeheroes.com, uh, or if you're interested in just the arcade, it's uh, arcadegalactic.com. Um, I'm on just about everything. I'm on Facebook, X used to be Twitter, um, sort of on LinkedIn, more just personal there. Um, YouTube is probably the biggest place that I'm at on there. And although recently the I've, I've tied a channel, a video site called BitShoot to my YouTube. And for a while, it wasn't uploading the videos to BitShoot from YouTube, but now it is. And I've actually been getting a lot of comments out of nowhere on that. So um, that's something, I guess. Um, but uh, yeah, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I don't post much on Instagram. Um, may do Pinterest here uh, before too long, but yeah, just about everything there. So just follow me there and we'll see you out there. So I'll put all those links down in the description so you guys can check them out. And thank you again, Adam, for coming on. I appreciate your time talking about Apple, giving advice to indie developers. And for anybody that's still watching, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. It helps us a ton. The way will continue to grow. We have the four-player tabletop and Konami versions of Galactic Battleground available and the T-shirts, which I'll throw up now. And until next time, peace. Later.